Well, I mean, the people here probably they don't need legislation, but because they educated enough to, to understand that they can make those food choices, they're probably living in places where you've got those choices, but maybe their kids aren't, maybe their grandchildren aren't, uh, you know, they're having school dinners that are a, a disgrace, and they cost two, you know, make processed foods for two pounds a, a day or whatever it is. I'll tell you, but 2 a.m. in L.A., me in that gas station, I need some legislation. Because even if you're rich, you can't, it, it, you know, there's nothing else you can do. It, do you know how hard it is to find healthy food in an airport? Mm. Or if you're on a train? Or, you know, and it's, it's interesting that all the food in transit, when people are poorly slept and probably highly stressed, tends to be the most processed and the, the, the food that's typically worse for you. I, I, it's interesting because I reflect on what Jamie Oliver did for, for schools and the impact that that, I think, was a net positive on schools, especially growing up. I was annoyed at the time because I was, I was in secondary school when that happened and our vending machine went from Mars bars to apples. But it shows, no, it was, we all remember how annoying that was to be on the receiving end of it. But in hindsight, again, that was really, really smart because a lot of young people develop their food habits in that window and those food habits will stay with them for life. I think it's probably gone back to uh, vending machine probably, without yeah. apples now. So th th it was a brief effect, but I think it, it got reversed, basically. So I, I think we do need legislation. Um, and, you know, I would start with schools and say, don't allow more than a certain percentage of ultra-processed food in schools. So there are some good schools in the country, and we should be adopting, what, doing what they are. Why should you have terrible food in hospitals? Why should you have terrible food in places where you're traveling and you haven't got any choice? Uh, we, you know, we should be treating these foods, which are costing the country around 90 billion pounds, about half the budget of the NHS. 30 billion goes as profit to directly to these food companies. You know, they should be putting that back, just like cigarette, you know, companies. And so we do need cigarette-style legislation. Not to ban it, because people will always want some sweet treats, but I don't see why we should be paying for the profits they're making, causing a problem to our society and our health and our mental health and all these other things. So definitely I would be bring in a real expansion of the sugar tax. But the easy ones are to change the environment in, in the place the government is in charge of. Why, why can't our, our children you know, be in a safe environment for at least their, what they're eating? And I think that's, we should all be lobbying for that uh, as, as an absolute minimum. And then you can work your way up through the taxing system and changing the labeling. Why, you know, Imagine having cigarettes in a supermarket saying, you know, um, oh, full of vitamin C and uh, it's a great source of uh, protein, you know, because they'd stuck some crap in there to, you know, or it's got iron in it because you've put in some iron filings, uh, which is what cornflakes and Special K have. You know, we should be getting angry about this and saying, no, you're not allowed to call it a health food fooling people who don't, you know, they're not educated, no better. So um, that's what I would be, you know, cutting out those health halos of this crap food. Clearly labelled as crap food. If you want to have it, absolutely fine. It's just say, but, you know, you're going to overeat by 25% and make lots of profit for these companies. You know, feel free, tuck in, but do it transparently. What was the most shocking thing? Because, you know, reading your previous book before, before the, the recipe book we're going to be talking about, you know, that bit of realising how bad orange juice is for you is, you know, for a whole generation. We were brought up orange juice at breakfast because that was going to be really good for us. And, you know, so there must have been certain things. I was very disappointed to find out donuts as well. I was certain there was going to be something good in donuts. We had donuts are almost entirely null and void, aren't they? Kale donuts, have you tried those? Oh, man. I tell you what, ever since you got that money from the kale marketing board, you've really changed. Um, but what, what was for you the thing you thought, I really, this is, f feels totally counterinstinctual to what you were brought up with in terms of healthiness? Well, it was lots of things. So, you know, because um, a lot of it was as a doctor being told these things are good, things are bad. So, brown bread good, white bread bad, but actually, the bread we get in meal deals and things like that is no different, whether it's dyed brown or it's white. 
So that was a bit of a shock. Um, you thought if you didn't have meat, that was going to be good. So you, you have your, your prawn sandwich or whatever, and you don't realize that the, the sauce it's in is absolutely terrible and full of 20 chemicals. Um, having muesli, I thought that was, you know, if, if you're a posh middle class, you know, keep muesli, oh, that's much better for you than, you know, the, the cheap cereals, and that was just as bad. Um, Cocoa Pops are really good for you, aren't they? Uh, so just some people it. claim. Just say it. No, they're not. But, um, but, you know, you'd have the special, special K, or you'd have, you know, something with all bran in it, and you'd think, okay, that's all really healthy. And, yeah, none of this stuff is healthy. It's all got all kinds of stuff you don't want in it. And because there's nothing real in it, they add these sort of fake vitamins for fortifying it. And as I said, you know, things like our, the cheapest possible additives to make give it a health halo. Um, but I, I was really shocked by orange juice. And it wasn't until I put a glucose monitor on myself that I really realized how bad it was that, you know, you could be... Everyone knows that a Coca-Cola is not great for you, but you drink it, you know exactly what you're drinking. I've got no problem with that, really. But health drink, orange juice, just because it's got some vitamin C, it has the same effect on your blood sugar and your hunger and everything else. And, you know, you find out actually what you thought was a healthy drink has been sitting in Brazil for three years in a giant vat, you know, and they've added all sorts of flavor chemicals into it and it, they make it look great. And it, I used to love it, but you know, it's just another ultra-processed food that I'm being conned on. So yeah, you, you, have, you, you develop a certain respect for the food industry that they've managed to fool you, and fooling me, a doctor, but um, ultimately, you, know, you start being then suspicious of everything that's produced in this way, and, and you start looking at the back of the labels and when, when you, you get the information. Um, but, yeah, the, the British diet of whether, you know, you think you're doing well with a muesli and an orange juice and some low-fat yogurt, and then you have your meal deal at lunchtime with some brown bread, some crisps, you know. I mean, by the time you've eaten that, it doesn't matter what you eat. You've had so much processing in your diet. You're extra hungry, you know, and you're gut is being affected, and this is someone who is trying to be healthy, let alone someone who didn't care. Mm -hmm. Well, let's find out from you, Stephen. I know that you, I, I believe, I hope I'm right, that your breakfast is normally uh, avocado and poached eggs? Yeah. Um, so let's go uh, yeah. through, yeah, uh, and then if you want to then follow up, uh, just um, Tim, in terms oh, of what we're getting. For, so, so a typical breakfast. Um, so I have, to, I have to caveat this and say, I fast a lot, so I, I typically, I often don't eat until pretty late in the afternoon. Um, but when I do eat, funnily enough, it's usually when I'm in a different time zone, when I do have breakfast, it's typically eggs, it's typically smoked salmon, um, some kefir. Um, Good, you've changed. Kombucha. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no orange juice anymore. I grew up, I used to show off to my dad, how healthy I was by drinking, the, the, like downing the sunny delight. And I was, I felt so I betrayed when I found out from the podcast with Tim when he first came on uh, and putting the Zoe patch on how uh, bad, how impactful it was for my glucose, my blood sugar levels. And I've not drank a glass of orange juice or apple juice or any of that since. Because there's some things in your diet that you could take or leave, but you, are you, you're living under the assumption that they're serving you. And what Zoe helped me do, but also from speaking to all these podcast guests, is make the decisions in my life, what I want to take and leave. Like, you know, um, tomato ketchup was one, where I thought, you know, tomatoes, that's like healthy, right? Turns out that's fucking poison, so that's out. So that used white to be a rice, popular day, didn't it? Yeah, with you? white yeah. rice. My mum's Nigerian, so you have white rice with everything. And I thought white rice was healthy. Turns out it's full of sugar. Uh, thanks to Tim, I found that out. So now... It's just all kale in my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's just... Life and doesn't get any better. And I'm so happy. I'm <laughs> I always thought tomato, because it's, there's an enzyme isn't there, in tomato, which is uh, very good in terms of for reducing your risk of, of, of prostate cancer. But, Lycopene, yes. Right. So interestingly, although tomato ketchup isn't good for you, a can of tomatoes, you know, that might look the same and is cheap, just a regular can of peeled tomatoes is really good for you. 
So, again, we have this strange idea that it doesn't mean that all things that come in cans or, or frozen or whatever are, are bad for you. It's just the ones that are concocted together that last forever that are made in factories. I've got but, a question for you. Do you know what I just said there, that I fast quite often and, frankly, unintentionally? So I fast. I probably have my first meal typically at about 2 p.m. sometimes. What's your view on fasting? Well, I, I do fast, not as, uh, so I don't usually eat before 11. And that, I usually finish eating about 9. So normally I've got a sort of 12 to 14 hour overnight fast. And that, I feel better do that, you know. And I, I'm, now, I'm never really, I don't feel hungry in the mornings. Right. And so I've got naturally to start eating when I'm feeling hungry, not just when I'm told to eat or when culturally we were supposed to eat. And the evidence does show that if you do leave a long time overnight, you're not eating, your gut microbes change their composition and they, you, they get the repair team have time to come out and clean up your gut and you get less symptoms and problems and less immune problems. So you can improve your immunity. And we did a big study with Zoe of over 100,000 people asking everyone to do this for three weeks. And about a third of people found it really easy. They loved it. A third of people did it, didn't find it particularly easy. A third of people immediately couldn't do it. And the people that did do it got a lot of benefit, actually felt less hungry overall, had more energy, mood improved, all kinds of benefits. So I think the point is that it generally helps your gut microbes, but not everyone, it doesn't suit everybody. So how many, part of the reason I do it is I actually think I'd find it harder to have breakfast because for some reason, I just don't seem to get hungry in the mornings. And I think when we were talking about lies we were told when we were younger, I was told, or I believed, that breakfast was good for you. And then you want to have lunch, then you need to have dinner. But as I've interviewed more and more people, I'm starting to dismiss this idea that you need to have three or four meals a day necessarily. So how many meals in a day is optimal? Or is there such a thing? I think we differ. And that's what we're seeing with Zoe is that, you know, there is this personalization um, some people do feel hungry when they wake up in the morning. And I don't, you don't, but... No, you, don't, no. You, no. anyone? There you go, we've got a few hungry breakfasters. They love breakfast, they love eating early in the day, and they're probably not very hungry, you know, at nine o'clock at night. So there is this difference between people, which is interesting. Um, but for the, we were told, you know, and the government still says, and the NHS website says, never skip breakfast, right? Never let your kids skip breakfast. There'll be delinquents at school if they do that. Absolutely no evidence that that's true at all. So, but you know, so listen, listen to your body, listen to your kids. There are, you know, I know lots of parents get crazy about having to try to force their kids to eat. And they say, I'm not hungry, mom, I'm not hungry. You know, and there's this big fight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't worry about that. If they're not genuinely hungry, that's fine. Um, and there's no evidence that if you follow your general instincts that you're having any problems. So I think it's all about listening to your body and not some cultural norm. Now, people have studied, you know, there are some people who really do like to eat four or five times uh, a day. Jonathan Wolf, CEO of Zoe, he can't fast. He finds it really hard. He gets very anxious and he has to be snacking on something. Uh, I'm very happy with two big meals a day. Uh, and you probably are as well, you know, or maybe more, I don't know. But, you'd, but it, I think they've tried to get people to eat on one big meal a day, and there are some enthusiasts. You may have had some of these people on your I think Chad Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, says he eats one meal a day. Most of these people are very rare, and most studies show you can't really get all the nutrients you need in one meal a day properly. You've got to, you know, your body can't actually get enough for the whole thing. So... That is probably too far to go. But uh, probably our ancestors didn't have breakfast. And when I was with this African tribe, you know, 10 years ago, the Hadza, they didn't eat breakfast. And why would you in the past? You know, you didn't have a fridge. You're not going to the hassle of preparing something. And of course, Kellogg's didn't exist. So um, it was a lot harder. So I think we were probably designed to have two meeting, two eat main eating events 
uh, during the day. Can I just check with the audience, does everyone know what um, Zoe is and how Zoe works? So I just wondered whether we should just talk a little bit about, does, does, is anyone not um, aware of what uh, Zoe is? Uh, yes, so guys, I'm it, the brand about. ambassador of the brand, so if you don't raise your hand right now, this reflects badly on me. Got one person here who doesn't know what Zoe is. Right. Oh, I think it's more than one Okay, person. so it's raise your hand if you know it. Yeah, so what, what goes on, what, 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 how, how exactly, do, you know, you're talking about what you're, you're monitoring in a day. So what is going on in a day when you are, uh, you know, using Zoe? In, in a day? Yeah. Um, so you do the initial testing period, which takes a stool sample. It takes a blood sample and it, you wear the continuous glucose monitor. I think now, since I first did the test, there's also a, a blue cookie, which um, monitors the part, your pass-through time. I believe that's what it's called. Essentially, how long it, the blue cookie takes between when it hits your tongue and when it comes out the other end, and that's an indicator of your health, your overall health, which Tim can speak to much more articulately than I can. So you do all of these tests, you then send the, um, those samples off, and you get personalized data back on your gut microbiome, your blood flat levels, your blood um, glucose response to different foods. Um, the Zoe app gives you a bunch of recipes, which are then tailored and scored based on your body's um, preferences. So through that test, I learned things. I learned my relationship with white rice. And I learned that I'm a 15 out of 100 when it comes to white rice. And I loved eating sushi and I thought it was healthy before. Um, turns out, so I've slimmed down things like white rice, uh, things that surprised me. Um, processed meat, things like ham. I had a really uh, adverse reaction to ham, which correlates to how I felt after I had ham. Tomato ketchup was one. And again, looking at the label, finding out that it's, what's it, 15 or 16 grams of sugar? a small amount of um, tomato ketchup, processed meats like sausages. Again, I used to think they were really healthy, changed my perspective on that. And then just the stuff you'd expect, things like, you know, things like dark chocolate, cacao, um, berries, blackberries, raspberries have become my dessert option. Right. And then the other thing that was really interesting when I did the Zoe test is they give you like a profile of your gut microbiome. And me and my partner both did it at the same time. So we can kind of compare the bugs, the good and bad bugs, that me and her both have in our gut microbiome. One of the really interesting things is I'm quite a, um, I'm an eater that's stuck in my ways. So if I, go to, if I go to a restaurant with you, you could probably, if you've been with me two or three times, you can order for me because I order the same things. My partner, I always thought she was a bit of a psychopath because she loves to go to a restaurant and try something she's never had before. And when we got our gut results back, her gut microbiome is like the Amazon rainforest. And mine is like a house plant. Like I just, she has this incredible diversity, which correlates to, if you look at her, you'll go, that's a person with a fantastic gut microbiome. <laughs> and so what's happened since I got my, my, my results back for the, the good and bad bugs that I have in my stomach is I, I now like people to order for me. So even when we were in LA and when we we're in New York with my team, my team ordered lunch for me because they're gonna order things that I would never order myself. And that's helped me. And she's actually just had her second test done with Zoe. And again, her gut microbiome has expanded ever more. And it's interesting, because you think of your gut microbiome, I don't know what people think of it, but I now think of it through the lens of my cognitive performance. I think of it through the lens of my sex life. I think of it through the lens of my emotional regulation as a CEO. I think of it through the lens of my workouts in the gym. And it's so unbelievably correlated to all of these things in a way that I just don't think people understand. So um, it's, a rev it's been a revelation in my life. And the other thing as a podcaster is you, you kind of see these health trends coming in because imagine I've been podcasting and interviewing hundreds of people for a long time. And then like three years, two, maybe two, three years ago, the first mention of the gut microbiome. And then everyone's talking about it, health expert after health expert. Um, and so when you said earlier that it's sort of 10 years and you said it was 20 years, I go, actually, in my experience, the subject of the gut microbiome is like three years old. That's when it really has taken off. The ultra process book when 80 years, Sunday Times bestseller, 80 weeks, Sunday Times bestseller, that's when I've seen in our data this huge interest in the gut microbiome and all of the things that it impacts. So, so yeah. It's good.